and the collect for today. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings and by following in his way, come to share in his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading comes from Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 4a. The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And Abraham set out and continued towards the Negev. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Second reading is Romans 4, 1 to 5, 13 to 17. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What the scriptures say, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing. The promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith in Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it's written, I've made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Praise to you, O Christ, King of eternal glory. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, 
Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you don't understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify of what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever got into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Father, we thank you for your word revealed to us in flesh. Touch us now, we pray, by his Spirit. Amen. So we started around 1800-ish, 2100 to 1800 B.C., we potter around to 55, 57 AD. Now we end up in the gospel with Jesus in the final knockings, really. And you know, you need to set the scene of this Genesis passage. The world was content. It was smug. It had one language. It said, let us build a tower up to God. We can do anything. The Tower of Babel, the ziggurat of Ur. And God said, oh yeah, you think cop this. The tower falls down. Everybody's got a different language. Suddenly the plans of man to rule the place is scattered a bit. And you know, it's quite fitting that there's a dissipation of all the people who are united in one language comes. But so too there's the action of a God who makes for himself a people. God establishes his rule through the people by calling a wandering Aramaean, a wandering pantheistic pagan believer, Abram. Doesn't become Abraham till we get to the circumcision in a few weeks' time. And here he is, him and Lot and Sarai. They go trotting off. And you know, it's funny because we get confused about Abraham, Abram. Genesis 12 to 50, the patriarchal narratives. This is where it all starts. This is where we get to hear 38 chapters of the dodgiest people you've ever met. Why God trusted this lot, I'll never know. No, she's not me wife. Oh, where's the balls come from, mate? This is the beginning of it all. And God has decided to enter into an agreement, into a relationship with this, this man. Was he... Spiritually sound? Who knows? Was he right before God? Well, God saw something in him. And he calls Abraham, and he's in taking this man. He says, right, pick up your stuff. Pull all stumps, mate, and off we go. And they go trotting off into the land of the Canaanites. And there's some really interesting things, because what makes Abraham so good is, Abraham hears God... And he is obedient. God says, do this. And he goes, all right, you're God. I suppose. How we knew he was God, I'm not quite sure. Because we've had the flood, we've had the coming together, we've had the dissipation. But he recognizes an authentic voice of the one who is Yahweh, the God of the Jews, the I am. And so he obediently goes. And that's the big thing. As Paul points out, it's not by his works It's by his obedient faith. 
If only the church had that one obedient faith today, my goodness me, where would we be? We'd be on the 15th service of the day by the time we get to 10 o'clock tonight. We'd be having to give them tickets. But instead, we, if we hear God, we certainly don't do it. And you know, Abraham, Abraham and Jesus, if you blessed Abraham, you blessed God. If you cursed Abraham, you cursed his God. The two were one and the same. The people of God reflected God and God dwelt within them. Nothing has changed today in the church. God dwells in the people of God. And they come to Shechem, and they also get to Bethel, scene of some other good stuff. But they get to Shechem, and God promises them that this land will be yours for your, your people to come. This will be the land that your descendants will inherit. Now that's faith. When you haven't got sprogs, when you're 75 and you think, oh my goodness me, that's a bit late now. Abraham didn't say, what are you talking about, Lord? You know, my descendants. Do you mean the people who follow me rather than my, you know, I'd got into a big debate because I'm like that. But he just goes, all right, I will bless the God I have encountered. Believing means that we believe what we don't have. Things unseen, the things that God places into our hearts. And you know, there he is in Shechem, there he is in Bethel. And God says, keep going, mate. And he leaves this ripe, fruitful land to go into the desert. I'm told that in Chelmsford we now have a, a thing where if you can't pay for your vicar, you're not going to get one. It's Chris Lyley, the old archdeacon, if you can't pay, you can't have. Well, I live in the desert. When I left and went just that short distance onto the leaf fields into an urban priority estate, when I left here and didn't take the call to a church in Leamington Spa because Wendy said, let's go somewhere difficult. I love my wife. She hears God so much more than I do at times because she was right. They can't pay for a cleric. They can't do stuff on that scuzzy estate of ours. Yesterday, a bang on the door. I've got no money. Yeah, because you drink. What's that in your pocket? I've got a two-year-old child, needs baby milk. Okay, let's go and get some. I can't go in, I don't like the shop. I said, walked in, I said, one to two baby milk? Yeah, over there. I said, he said, you haven't got a sprog, have you? One of your girls had a baby. I said, oh, please don't, not yet. <sighs> and he said, what are you buying that for? I said, got a bloke, doesn't like coming in. He looks at the camera and says, yeah, he's barred. He's been caught nicking three times. And then he says, I need to get some other food. I was great, we sorted out the food. He said, oh, and I just need this as well. And I said, what's going on? You've told me six different stories. And he said, well, I owe some money to the, the Provident, and they'll be round this afternoon, and I need to give them £16.50. So he walked off with £18. And you know, there's an old saying, if you give someone £18 and you never see them again, it was probably worth it. Will he come back? I don't know, but what does church do but open its arms? We're so worried about the real challenges in life, the numbers on the pews and the amount in the bank. But you know, the image of the invisible God truly is made visible in the person before you. How can we love God and hate our brothers, John, John tells us, so there we are, Adam's faith, Adam. Adam's sin causes the trouble, Abraham's faith. I, mean, I was walking around to half past two this morning, street angeling, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm a little rocky. But Abraham's faith was made real by his doing, as God commanded. 
He's the physical beginning of the people of God. He's the one the rabbis and the teachers of the Jewish faith point to as the source of all blessing, as if he was something godlike. Power in his name and being one of his people, and we still do that. I've been invited to go and have breakfast with Peter Vandenberg from CFAN next week, but I can't afford £28 for breakfast to see a bloke I used to work with. He can pop in on the way round if he wants to see me. But we have all these names that we watch, that we, we worship, and yet who do we worship? The name above all names, Jesus. That's the only name that matters. He who dies and reconciles us to the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And good old Paul gets quite uptight about this. The Jews think they're special because they've got the law. The law doesn't make you saved. I love the Decalogue. I would say the Ten Commandments every morning. In fact, I tend to. Me and Jesus stand there like that. He's up there, so I can't quite work out where his arm is. Shema Yisrael, love the Canaan, Adonai. We, we say here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your body. Everything you've got, that's what it's all about. Not the law. The law doesn't. Moses, the lawgiver. Yay, the world's got a headache. Take two tablets. Brilliant. But if only the world did, there'd be less headaches. Paul looks at this Abraham, Abraham figure, and he says, guys, will you stop doing what you're doing? Look past Abraham. Don't look at what you belong to. I'm part of St. Edith's. We've got a great history. Yeah, it has. I love this building. And the day I was ordained and plonked in that stall up there and realized that there to there is actually the same distance as altar to the back of the church where I was sent from. I love this place, but having been part of this doesn't make me saved. Having been part of the Church of England, my goodness me, we've got our problems, doesn't make you saved. The law only seeks to make you aware of our wrongdoings, but we live by grace, we live by the light of God, and Paul is really, really wanting the people to look past Abraham, Abraham. This is a man who he wants us to look at faith, wants us to understand the words of the 7th century Isaiah when he, 650, and they go trunking off to exile. The promises Isaiah talks about, Paul talks about, that the love of God, the reconciliation made real for us. It's for Jew and Gentile alike, those who were near and far off spiritually and physically. This is Something that is made real for us in John 3.16 in a second. Paul wants you to understand that it's not about being one of Abraham's offspring, because even if they didn't shout, stones themselves would come trotting up in three weeks' time. This is an important bunch of passages for us. It shows the start of a relationship with humanity in a way that has proved that there is a God in Israel and beyond. No local God for the Jews. He's everywhere. But it says, don't put your hope in man. Don't put your hope in works, but put your hope, your trust in faith. And that faith is in Jesus Christ. So we move round about, oh, I don't know, 30, 32, 33 AD, and there's Jesus met by Nicodemus, a teacher of the law, a member of the Sanhedrin. That's 70 people who are the people. He is a theologian. He's a teacher of the people, Jesus says to him. And he comes by night because he doesn't want people to know. And does he speak for himself? I don't know, because he says, we, we know, that, you know, hang on, we, who's the we? Do you mean I, or do you mean you and the other guys in the Sanhedrin? Are you uh, recognizing that Jesus is, well, we know you're a, a good man and that God's on your side. Oh, you Wally, you had the chance there to say, I know you are the son of God. And Jesus, in a minute, does a little, little knock for this theologian. But the trouble is, theologians, we do so much theology. I've 
I've managed to go through four theological institutions in my time, and what do I know? Nothing. Like Socrates says, the more I learn, the less I understand and the less I have in my pocket and the more I need to learn. That's why this Lent I've taken up books. Just got Tom's Wright's History and Eschatology. My goodness me, that's an easy read. But you know, theologians don't understand much. When I was a baby, I was at Westminster, Oxford, and we had the, bish the Archbishop of York come and say, oh, virgin birth, it never happened. A few weeks later, the rose window gets hit, there's a fire, and everyone goes, yeah, got you. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, I don't know. Same things we talk about in theological college, in the bar, on the water, in, in the boat, while you're trying to breathe after you've been rowing. You know, some of the things we discuss, we discuss to say, what if? How do we take a fully divine and a fully human man and put the two together? How does it not blow Jesus' head off? Doesn't one, you know, and this, this Lent, I've gone mad. I'm, I've, been, I've been through Nicaea, I've popped off at Ephesus, I'm now in Chalcedon, and I'm looking at the way that the church tried to reconcile it. Our theology sometimes leads us into more troubles. If you don't believe me, go home and read the Athanasian Creed. But you know, this is really, really important because Jesus talks to this teacher of the law and he goes, oh, you Wally. He gives him little indications. The son of man, the one who's gone up into heaven. Well, Matthew 26 helps with that. We've got ascension coming. That's going to be at St. Francis this year, by the way, and Wendy's preaching, so you'll get a proper sermon for once. He speaks about the three persons of God, the three separate characters, the one who loves creation so much that he's the author of our salvation, the son who is the means by which the salvation comes, and the spirit, that wind which blows where it wants. That's a big thing. We are inspired. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going up, says Jesus, so that I, I'm disappearing, so that I can be with you. Jesus points to all these things about being born again. The Jews would say being born again. The water was the amniotic fluid and the, the fluid and the spirit gives life to everything. But Jesus is maybe talking more accurately about the theophany that appeared when he's baptized, the water of baptism, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Sadly, in the, as a Pentecostal pastor, we used to swing from the chandeliers and speaking tongues and these days I'm lucky if I get even get an alleluia anywhere I go from the Anglican side of my life. We don't get excited about the word. We don't get taken up by all that God is. And you know, when I first saw a word in monogene, it's monogene, it means the one and only. Jesus is that one and only, that one God-made man, incarnate being, who brings for us our salvation. And this teacher didn't understand any of that. But you know, a few years ago, I was stuck in a place called Douai in France, and I had all my toms, all the soldiers were stuck in, the, in a gym with camp cots. And we had a doctor come and they said, oh, Padre, you have to go and stay in the officer's mess with the, part, with the doctor. And you know, I hate that. I don't like being away from my men. And I bought every one of them a replica John 3.16 Bible that they had in World War I. And they're laying there in their camp cots, and one of them goes, what's this book that Padre's given me? And one of them said, oh, look, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only one begotten son, Monogene, that whoever believes in him should not perish. Next morning, breakfast, Padre, come over here. And I said, oh, no, this could be bad. Last time they did that, they gave me a mankini, which I've never worn. The rest of them did, but luckily I'd taken someone to hospital that day, so I'm nowhere in the photograph. And I thought, oh Lord, 
of this cup, you know, if you can let it pass from my lips, what are they going to do to me now? And someone said, John 3.16. Yeah. If I believe in Jesus, yeah. If I believe that God sent him, does that mean I'm a Christian? Yeah, you're on the way. Yeah, repent, believe, be baptized, receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's the first step if you believe. I said, oh, I said, but when are you doing communion again? I said, Same thing every day, six o'clock, ten up the end. Oh, right. And I thought, okay, what's that all about? Next morning I had 18, 19 extra soldiers. Out of the army life in the last 15 years, I've seen only 12 men go towards ordination. Probably no more than 50 come to faith. And you know, their faith, because they're soldiers, is disciplined. That's what Jesus wants us to do. That's what Paul wants us to do. Run the race not to please your boss, but you run the race to please your commanding officer. You run the race to win the crown. We don't run the race. We look to the law. We look to the characters when we don't look to the Christ. And that's what today is about for us. I'm sorry it's a long sermon, but I need you to take this away. Unless you look at the Christ, unless you make the Christ yours, unless you make you his, then what do we have? Nothing. We have a club. In a moment, someone will bring the, the subs up. And we wonder where some of the members have gone. But that's not who we are. We're family. We're one people in God. Made real for us by the sacrifice of the Christ. Not by faith in Abraham or by keeping the law, but please do. Not by being part of something. I'm an evangelical. I'm a charismatic. I'm high church. I'm a tack queen. I'm so confused, it's unbelievable. I even have a thirable. It sometimes frightens the people when I get that out just because it's a high day. Colours, sights, sounds, smells, our senses, that's what God wants to impact upon, have an impact on, impact upon. I hate people saying that, I'm getting modern. You see what this is about today? Don't follow a man, follow the man who is God. Follow the Christ, be reconciled to God. And in your Lenten journey, take up your cross, deny yourself, look at the law, but follow Christ. Because it's faith, not works. I sometimes worry about the people who leave behind the memorials, even though I love the windows. My church in where somebody bought a new lawnmower and that guaranteed him access into heaven. Except on the weekend that I have to mow the lawns, in which case I consigned him quite often to hell. It was a big lawn. When he comes, where's he going to find you? Watching, waiting, sharing the gospel, sharing the resources of his love. Or will you be in church just getting a tick in the box? One of them's good, it pays the parish share a bit, and it keeps the every Sunday attendance up so the archdemon and the bishop don't come and see us. But it's what's in there. It's how we live, it's who we live as because of him who died. That's what Lent's about. That's what every day is about. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that to trust in Jesus is to bring eternal life into our being. To be reborn, to have the wind of the Holy Spirit blow through us and blow the cobwebs away. To inspire our thinking, to call us to places that are nowhere near as pretty as Ur and Shechem, but much akin to the Negev and the wilderness there. Lord, you'll build your church by people taking your word out, by people living in faith, keeping your word, trusting you. May that be how you see us. 
May that be who we are because of the Christ. We ask this in your glorious and amazing name. Amen.